good deal of interest has developed in recent years around the cultural relevance of the material detritus left over from the past. This has taken a number of forms and includes an understanding of the importance of second-hand cultures to consumer practices, rubbish as a signifier of our society, a focus on the sense of loss and haunting associated with the encounter with industrial and other ruins, to wider consideration of questions of the social and material entanglement around practices of disposal. From the evocative power to remind us of past lives and ghostly presences, to the ability to trace out a way of recapturing a gesture from past lives, to revealing the gaps, holes, and also the excesses of the archive, leftover bits of the past can, as Walter Benjamin knew long ago, create new juxtapositions in the present that allow us to see both the past and our own time with fresh eyes. It seems that in thinking about how we attune to the past and those who once lived, that it is all about ruins. Yet for me, the notion of ruin doesn't quite capture what we are dealing with here as well as it might. Ruins are already in a state of decay but they are not always discarded or overlooked. Their power to evoke memory of a forgotten past is sometimes limited beyond any immediate encounter. Often, they are located within representational work to be done to derive meaning from them, the meaning uh, coming more from the interpretation than the encounter itself. Ruins certainly produce a dynamic interpretive relationship between the past and the present, but they are limited by their paradoxically completed status as a broken whole. I want to propose that in looking at the attunement that emerges between our encounter with the past within the present, that we move away from the trope of the ruin and its ghostly voices and seek out something else. We do not have far to travel. That something else I propose is the fragment. And while fragments in the plural might be seen to have a kinship with ruins if we understand them simply as broken objects or parts of broken objects. I want to argue that there is much more to the fragment than this. Thirty years ago, the sociologist David Frisbee published a book entitled Fragments of Modernity. Key to this work was Frisbee's partially successful attempt to resurrect the German sociologist Georg Simmel from the footnotes and re-establish him <coughs> as an influential figure for sociological thought. Beginning with his work with Tom Bottomore on translating Zimmel's most important work, The Philosophy of Money, in 1978, and later through a detailed analysis of Zimmel's impressionistic approach to social investigation expressed in his many essays, Frisbee sought to re-establish Zimmel as a leading theorist of modernity in his Fragments book and as someone whose ideas had had a lasting impact on the cultural analysis of later writers such as Siegfried in order to understand the approach that Zimmel and later Krakow and Benjamin took to the question of modernity, Frisbee used the trope of the fragment as an organising term to show how their approach to investigating the modern world addressed what Baudelaire had previously called the fleeting, ephemeral, and the contingent nature of modernity. <coughs> if people spoke of fragments at all prior to that point, it was more typically through notions of fragmentation and alienation as features of modern experience. While not concerned with materiality explicitly, Frisbee's interest sought to do one significant thing, show the link between the seemingly inconsequential stuff of social life that had once fascinated Zimmel and his contemporaries, to an understanding of modernity as a new and emergent totality. A fragment is typically understood as a remainder. It is usually imagined as a small, broken part of a whole that once was. Of, of course, fragments can also be simulated, created as fragments from the outset. Leaving aside whether the fragment is some form of remains that have been passed down through time incomplete, received fragments, 
or whether it has been made as some form of deliberately incomplete artwork, created fragments, we can say that how we apprehend the past through fragments has long been a common feature of any form of historical understanding. The fragment is how history is always apprehended. The past does not come down to us complete, even during a time of living memory or oral traditions. History is full of broken bits of stuff, fragmentary texts, incomplete parish records, corroded grave goods, brooches without pins, and endless bits of pottery seemingly strewn about by our ancestors like seeds thrown to the wind. These torn scraps of previous lives are all that there is to go on if we want to try and piece together a credible story and make sense of it all and our relationship to it. The project of history, especially in Europe since the 19th century, has been to get as much of the story of past events, places or lives as it is possible to do and the fragments of the source material. But there is a self-consciousness that surrounds this apprehension of the fragment too. Since the early renaissance of the 14th century, an interest in the incomplete remains of the past has been an enduring feature of understanding the past. But it wasn't always the case. The fragment only starts to become culturally recognisable, relevant to the study of the past, especially the classical past when the ancient past ceases to present itself in complete forms. According to the historian Glenn Most, the fascination with fragments began in particular when the search for extant ancient manuscripts from the then recognized great classical authors began to become something of a fruitless task. The knowledge of ancient works kept alive in medieval monasteries and in the libraries of the Islamic universities after the decline of Rome was still something that scholars in the medieval period might live in hope of finding. From the 14th century, however, this hope was starting to fade, and the search came to be recognized as a vain one, as the hunters of ancient manuscripts found it ever more difficult to unearth whole, undiscovered texts. No more were turning up. Increasingly, it was only incomplete manuscripts or fragments of text that were being found in the corners of obscure libraries. The search moved from one for whole manuscripts to a search for the fragmentary remains. From then, the fragment came into its own. The beginnings of printing helped to accelerate this knowledge of the ancient world and to promote both the full text and the known fragments as its archive. As most suggest, by the end of the 16th century, pretty much all the works of ancient classical authors that we know of today had been published and made available, including the fragments and one could see the gaps, particularly of lost texts referred to in other works, as clearly as the complete works. This interest in the fragment developed into, into a more systematic form of investigation in the 18th and 19th centuries, in diverse and emerging scientific fields, from classical studies to philology to archaeology. This interpretive study took typically took a range of approaches to the investigation of the fragment that included, one, trying to reconstitute whole artifacts from fragments in order to understand them better. Two, trying to establish the authenticity of fragments as important scraps from the ancient past. Three, authenticating original elements in fragments from later additions, amendments, or restorations. And four, establishing the validity of fragments in relation to one another. This approach to the study of the fragment led to the development of a second phase in the fascination with it from the late 18th century, and it became a key feature of romantic thought, especially within the philosophical writings of the leading figures within German Romanticism based in Jena, with the work notably of the Schlegel brothers and with the journal The Athenaeum. Taking inspiration first from the new approach to the study of classical art that Johannes Winkelmann had promoted in the 1750s, one which sought to understand artworks not simply in terms of their individual aesthetic merits, but by understanding them as part of a sequence of historical developments over time, scholars in this period shifted from an interest in the singularities of the ancient world to trying to understand classical culture as a singular whole through its material artifacts. This theme of totality underscores such an approach. 
is a defining one for the modern episteme, one that marks it off from earlier fascinations with the signification of the infinite nature of reality in Renaissance and Baroque understanding. The idea of totality is what emerges from the period of exploration and colonial conquest, an age of the world picture, Heidegger calls it, developed in which that world is sought as a totality that can be understood in all its diversity and difference as a bounded whole that could be ordered and classified by the newly emerging sciences as much as by historical and artistic appreciation. Such a belief would not have been possible but for the fragments in which that whole was known and it is around this theme that early German Romanticism sought, to un sought an understanding of the complex relationship between wholes and fragments. Since the Renaissance then, the fragment has come to be seen as an important way, is as important in that it may reveal something about the whole that was missing from the archive. But within this classical notion of the fragment, there is a sense that a fragment is always in some respects a supplement to the complete work. German Romanticism, however, did something completely new with the notion of the fragment and its entanglement with this issue of totality. It elevated the fragment from its earlier status as a remainder and saw it instead as a way of understanding culture as a totality. The main distinction between a romantic notion of the fragment and the earlier classical understanding has to do with the way in which it came to be understood, not as a supplement to understanding totality, better found in other more extended works, but a self-created understanding of it through the partial or incomplete in itself. For Romanticism, a fragment ceases to be a bit of something, a bit of the totality, and comes to be seen as the totality itself in its fragmentary form. As Friedrich Schlegel defined it in fragment 206 of his Philosophical Fragments, and I quote, a fragment, like a miniature work of art, has to be entirely isolated from the surrounding world and can be complete in itself like a hedgehog. <laughs> the most significant contribution that Schlegel and others within the Athenaeum group brought to an understanding of the importance of fragments was to treat them not as broken holes or ruins, but as singularities with a freshness of purpose. It is through the singular, rather than the broken whole, that they believe the idea of totality could be apprehended. Recent studies of this notion of the fragment within German Rodent and Romanticism all emphasize this point. For Rudolf Gachet, for example, in his 1991 preface to the translation of Schlegel's philosophical fragments, a central tenet of Schlegel's philosophy is the idea that the fragment is inseparable from a notion of wholeness because it is the idea of the fragment that posits that notion of wholeness itself. The idea of the whole in, other, in modern thought, in other words, can only exist from the perspective of the fragment. If the modern understanding of totality can only be understood from the perspective of the fragment, it holds that the idea of the fragment is inseparable from this act of positing. The fragment for Schlegel is singular unto itself as a prickly hedgehog. And that totality can come to be grasped through the particular fragment under consideration. In this sense, the fragment is quite different from the earlier idea of the fragment as part of a broken whole. As Gachet puts it, I quote again, in short, if the romantic fragment can be demarcated from a notion of the fragment that is part of a once constituted or future whole, it is because it thematizes an essential fragmentation of the whole as such, owing to the necessary individualizing presentation or self-production. It is in this context that we can also situate writers like Zimmel. He was in this respect an heir to the German Romantic tradition and its approach to the fragment. He sought to analyze, in sociological rather than poetic or painterly form, the fragments of modern life in order to get it to an understanding of the alienated and fragmented experience of modern life in a capitalist money-driven world in which social relationships are mediated by abstract reified relationships. He called this a tragedy of culture, but all the same, rather than seek to return to a world of wholeness and tradition, 
The study of fragments is used to posit a new self-referential modern form of totality. His heirs too, the early Lukács, Benjamin, Krakow, all anti-capitalist critics of modern society, adopt a similar approach in valorizing both the theme of fragmentation and dwelling on the detritus, surface appearances, and broken remains of modern life. The commodity fetish becomes capitalism's fragment in their hands. They also approach it by fragmentary forms of writing, essays, aphorisms, and montages of collages of quotes and textual fragments in which the totality might be grasped because they know it cannot be grasped as a totality. For Romanticism, the totality, and by that they mean modernity and its place in history, cannot be grasped as a whole, nor in the abstract, but only through the myriad forms of fragments, one by one, through which that notion of totality can be understood. To explore this issue further, I want to choose one particular type of fragment and some of the challenges it poses. We'll move to the next slide. Shortly before his death in 1831, the philosopher Hegel delivered a series of lectures that would be published posthumously as the philosophy of history in 1837. A high point of this romantic search for totality in understanding the relationship between the present and the past, this is a work that seeks to understand modernity as the realization of the rational spirit culminating in the world of the modern Prussian state. Hegel could not have imagined that later in that same decade, a technology would emerge that would change everything about how we approach the past. Since 1839, all history has become a product of photography in its various fragmentary forms. If we want to understand the complex dynamics of the fragment that I've described in the first half of the paper, its relation to wholeness, to the past, to ruins, and to the idea of the modern, then it is to this type of fragment we should turn. Early attempts to understand the relationship between photography and history arise directly out of Zimmel's versioning of the fragmentary understanding of modern life, notably in essays by Siegfried Krakow and Walter Benjamin. Their appreciation of the significance of photography to modernity was an uneasy one but one that, had, one that has had a lasting impact on how that me medium of image making is understood. In his essay, Photography, first published in 1927, Krakow offers a critical reading of the role of photography in relation to the transformation in historical understanding since the 19th century that it helps to bring about. He suggests that the arrival of historic, historicist and totalizing approaches to the develops in the 19th century around the same time as the beginnings of photography. Whereas historicism seeks to present the past as a temporal continuum, the photograph, Krakow contends, presents a synonymous spatial continuum in the services of historicism. For Krakow in this essay, it is human memory that is made up of fragments and not the photographs, which he sees as part of a complete record that allow no room for creative interpretation. The fragmentary nature of memory is seen by Krakow as a more authentic way of understanding the past in which the memory image contrasts with the inauthenticity of the photographic image as little more than an inventory in which death is somehow vanished. He says, I quote, what the photographs by their sheer accumulation attempt to banish is the recollection of death, which is part and parcel of every memory image. Sums up his position there. This critical approach to photography was to have echoes in later work on its relationship to the idea of modern capitalist society as alienating and in which the photographic and filmic image becomes the medium of that alienation as spectacle. It is in a somewhat parallel work by Walter Benjamin, however, that we first see a somewhat more receptive and nuanced approach to the medium. Also written in 1927, his essay, a short history of photography, picks out as a major theme the relationship between photography and history. Benjamin, as on so many issues, is suggestively more ambiguous than many of his Frankfurt contemporaries, including Krakow. And his understanding of photography is no different in that respect. 
like those contemporaries, major themes that he was wrestling with were the twin relationship of photography to art and photography to memory. While he sees the early history of photography entangled in its relationship to art in the way in which both seek to depict reality around a complex engagement with the notion of aura, the main observation that I think we can take from his uh, essay uh, that he makes is that it, despite its intentions, despite the intentions of the photographer, the photograph, because of the way in which it depicts, has within it something beyond the intentions of its producer. And I quote again from him. No matter how artful the photographer, no matter how careful posed his subject, the beholder feels the irresistible urge to search such a picture for the tiny spark of contingency of the here and now with which reality has, so to speak, seared the subject, to find the inconspicuous spot where in the immediacy of that long forgotten moment the future subsists so eloquently that we, look, that we looking back, may rediscover it. He goes on famously to suggest that photography reveals in this way an optical unconscious that shows things beyond the eye. It is through that that we might add that we come to attune to the image. What separates Benjamin's position from that of Krakur and later critics of photography is this sense of excess, that tiny spark of contingency that has the power to shock and to awaken to a different sensibility, including a sensibility of the past, which all photographs have entwined. This theme of shock, which Benjamin derives from surrealism, is a major theme in his work and a key element in his attempt to develop a methodological approach to the through juxtapositions and shocks and how, we, how the past comes to be seen in the present, in which he calls dialectical images, becomes the medium of altered ways of seeing and new forms of consciousness. Notably, Benjamin first associates this power to shock to, photograph, to photographs produced in the first decade of the new medium. The shock is precisely that which escapes the power of the photographer as creator of the image and it is something that may not be apparent at first. Its resonance may develop over time, the further away we move from the time in which the photograph was taken. What Benjamin is grappling with here, I suggest, is a notion of the photograph as fragment. Whereas Krakow locates the power of the fragment within the reception of the memory image, for Benjamin it exists in the reception of the material remains found with the image of reality in the image production of photography. What we can take from Benjamin's understanding of photography are three key points. First, that the photograph has an independence from the creative power and intention of the photographer. Second, that photographs have the ability to undermine the aura of the reception of the image. And third, that they have the power to shock. In this respect, Benjamin is close to the tradition of the fragment in German Romanticism. Each of these observations gives a concrete material form to the more abstract idea of the fragment that they were seeking to develop. But this is what fragments do. They have an independence from any sense of creative authorship. They challenge the received understanding of what is shown. And they have the power to transform how we see and how we understand what we see as the more than the sum of the little bits of stuff we find around us. In other words, the space of the fragment, which is intimately connected with issues of authorship, creative powers to see and to interpret the world, is also a space outside and other to those subjective qualities. The fragment, rather than a material thing and just that, is also a space, a space of singularity in which materiality and human affect come into contact in the act of seeking to make sense of the world as presence. Roland Barthes recognised something of this in his reading of the relationship between the photograph and history. The photographs, he suggests, have a distinctive singularity, not in what they depict photograph by photograph, but in their relationship to reality and the passing of time. What he acknowledges more than Benjamin is that photographs are nothing to do with representation. Photographs don't mean anything despite their author's ability to contrive an image that they want to show. They are different from other images in that respect. As he points out, 
photographs have an attachment to a referent rather than to a signified, and, is, and it is that that defines the category of the image that we call a photograph. A photograph's essence, Bart suggests, is its non-metaphoric relationship to reality. The photograph dwells in the space that is outside of meaning. It is an inaccessible space of presence that cannot be encountered through the techniques of representation. Presence is other. It is outside of meaning, yet it is also the space in which we seek to derive meaning. No image, Bart suggests, speaks for itself or its author. Rather, it is witness to what it shows, rather than a recollection of it. Above all, Bart suggests the distinctive expression of the photograph is that it reveals time passing and the passage's relationship to death. If each individual photograph might have an element within it that acts as a punctum, which is another term for Benjamin's optical unconscious, that opens up another space onto presence that disrupts the composition of reality that is seemingly shown, then Bart goes on to suggest that the punctum of photography itself, in the wider sense, is a, as a way of making images, is to show time passing as an absent presence. Every photograph is taken in an instant, varying focal length and shutter speed. But it has an afterlife in the passage of time in which that instant recedes from living memory, from the lives of those depicted, and from the moment of the now that it captures. And yet that presence remains all the same. More generally then, the space of the fragment is not a space of meaning, but the space of presence. But what are the fate of history in this? How do we relate to the past through this space of presence? To consider that, I suggest, we should return to Krakow, but not to his rather dismissive essay of 1927, but to a book he wrote in the 1960s, at the end of his life, and which was only published posthumously in 1969, as History, The Last Things Before the Last. This is a work that is also about the relationship between history, time passing, and photography, but in it, Krakow develops a quite different and more sympathetic approach to photography than he had taken previously. There again, Krakow notes the relationship between historiography and the advent of photography. In this reading of photography, though, it is no longer seen as a naive recording of reality in the abundance of a series of images that makes up a complete archive, but rather as something that singularly tries to get within physical reality. In doing so, Krakow suggests the photograph includes completeness. Instead of glossing over the fragmented and alienated character of modern life, it starts to now act as a fragment in a manner we can understand deriving from the romantic tradition. And I'm quoting, Chance configurations being fragments, photography further tends to suggest endlessness. A genuine photograph precludes the notion of completeness. Its frame marks a provisional limit. Its contents point beyond the frame, referring to a multitude of real life phenomena which cannot possibly be encompassed in their entirety. In other words, as a fragment, a photograph seeks to wrestle with the totality of the now that it depicts, but in so doing, only points to an outside of space, to time, that can never be shown directly, except as a possibility. For Krakow in this later work, the photograph is all about indetermination and defamiliarization, themes that he had previously rejected in the 1920s. He goes on to suggest that an understanding of the effects of the photograph offer up a new perspective on history, that the totality can never be grasped as a totality, but only from the specific that is now shown in the image. The totality is outside its grasp, but its absent presence revealed nonetheless. The photographs in, in, term, in the terms discussed above posits history as a totality, but one that can never be captured as such. To do so would be to deny the essence of the photographic image. In this respect, the photograph runs the risk, like all fragments, of becoming just another broken hole. One image among many, a ruin. But in this paradox, the photograph as such, if not the individual image, succeeds in neither grasping the totality nor becoming a ruin, but existing in a relation of tension. 
between the two. And that is how we become attuned to the past. In speaking in this way, Cracker in many ways sums up a position on photography that defines it in relation to the idea of history that history takes within the modern world. Earlier historians had fragments of record, texts, paintings perhaps, likenesses, but their access to past reality to its presence was always one step removed and filtered through the language of textual or painterly meaning and interpretation. Not so the photograph. Modernity, that most ungraspable of ideas, is ushered in with a new technology, able to faithfully record in images fragments of the now that can become accessible as an enduring record of the past as time passes. The abundance of images suggests a complete archive of total recollection and accessibility. And yet look at any image that was taken and it becomes ever more mysterious with the passing of time because what passes in the then present is the then present and not presence itself. The present and presence are held together through that disassociation. The photograph continues to conjure up presence long after the event has gone. That presence becomes an absent presence, which is the only totality we can ever really know. In our archives, we seem to have a full record of the past through photographic images, but only in their strangeness and removal from our understanding. Each photograph, while a part of a multitude of images, produced through a recognized and understood technique, presents the past in the form of a singularity, a key characteristic of the fragment. All fragments do this, including those bits of old pottery. But more than any other type of fragment, the photograph most clearly articulates the ideal of the fragment established in the Romantic approach, mm -hmm. both in form and as itself a product of the modernity as a fragmented totality that it seeks to understand. Every photograph, the great ones as well as the more mundane, is in some ways like Schlegel's hedgehog. Every photograph in its singular and particular manner is self-contained and seeks towards an image of the whole. That whole is there in every photograph, the moment of the now, <coughs> and what it is to live in this moment. In some, it is more apparent than in others, but always as an absent presence that can never ever be fully grasped. Although it has many beginnings and locational differences, that modernity might be said to be recognised as such for the first time with a pictorial fragment of reality. Uh, next slide. A grainy daguerreotype of the barricades of the Rue saint Leur in Paris on the 25th of June, 1848. This should be a familiar image to any student of European history. Modernity, history and photography collide in this image fragment. It is so early in the history of that medium. It is tempting to present this as a metaphor full of hidden meaning, such a portentous event, full of hope and yet so tragic in its outcome and so on. But we cannot do that. To load such meaning on it would be to turn it from a fragment into a ruin. This is such a familiar image and yet made defamiliar by the passing of time, by the optical unconscious of time that photographs convey. This image encapsulates not a story of modernity through, though it might attempt such a reading. It shows the past as presence, but not of the now. We are not dealing with a representation of modernity and its history here, but rather with the presence of history as an absence encapsulated in the fragment of the past. And here lies the central challenge. The fragment aspires to an understanding of the totality, but can only do so for the act of not attaining it. To actually attain what it sets out to achieve is an impossibility. The fragment as singularity that posits an understanding of culture as a whole is always in danger of slipping back into ruin in its search to achieve that aim. In so doing, it risks becoming just another broken hole. In telling the story of the whole, which is all the fragment is able to do in its essential incompletion, it runs the risk of losing its hedgehog-like self-referential status, though the temptation to turn the fragment through this uh, 
a temptation to turn the fragment into a form of fabulation. As Eugenio Donato put it, a key, cultural ch a key challenge for the whole romantic project is that its forward-looking search for total understanding is always on the abyss of turning into decadence and failure, I quote. The past as memory remains buried and ruined, a well inhabited by fragments incapable of presenting themselves to the light of memory without the elaborate machinery of linguistic construction and representation. In moving from fragment to ruin, affect is lost, in other words. That is the difference between them. In encountering this, we do not find then something deep, deeply meaningful, but a blankness that invites us to fill the void rather than recognize it for what it is. In saying this, I'm reminded of some words by Maurice Blanchot on the significance of the image of the final slide. And these are my final words. The essence of the image is to be altogether outside, without intimacy, and yet more inaccessible and mysterious than the thought of the innermost being. Without signification, yet summoning up the depths of any possible meaning, unrevealed, yet manifest, having the absence as present which constitutes the lure and fascination of the side. So I'm not quite sold that one can read the photograph allegorically. That it, obviously that is a particular form of signification. It's an indirect one. It's one that's you know, loaded with uncertainty, certainly. Um, but it's still dealing with signification, dealing with the signified, albeit in an indirect way. Whereas I'm more taken with Bach's notion. This is the as it is taken in that moment. And over time, that image becomes the then, and things are then transformed through our relationship with it. And I think it's that that I'm trying to explore here, that that I think the photograph as a fragment conveys, more than trying to read that image or any other image that I want to show allegorically as something. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted, but I'm going to hold back. Yeah. 
it's so that people have this as it is, as you're getting to. Is that kind of, is it kind of creating a world itself, or is it a mini world of this? Um, I think in, in the context of the theme of attunement is often taken up in the sense of this relation between life. read though the, the uh, philosophical fragments, what, what he is very much engaging in, in with them, it, it's a mixture of things. Some of, some of it is sort of, you know, very abstract philosophical points that he's making. Others are, you know, comments on daily life around him and sort of observations and things like that. So I, I'm not sure that he, he is sort of entirely detaching in an abstract way from the world. I don't think he is engaging with it, but he's looking to do that to sort of encapsulate in the form that he does, um, you know, to, to give it, and that's what a lot of that romantic tradition tries to do, it, try, it, it tries to sort of depict the world through the partial, through the particular, through the fragment, as a whole. The key point that I'm making is that that is fund you know, it's, it's fundamentally problematic, if you like, in that to do so and to recognise yourself as doing that and to achieve that is to deny the possibility of what you're trying to achieve at the outset. It is, you know, the, diff the difference between, it, it, if you like, it is a difference between affect and cognition. It is, you know, the fragment affords or attunes one to affect. You know, it's, it's an image that strikes you, that has an immediacy, that has a power. Whereas the ruin is overlaid with meaning, interpretation, understanding, you know, recognition that is very much sort of, you know, filtered through that sort of, um, that, through that language. And I think for me that's the difference. And what I'm trying to get here is the sort of more paradoxical nature of, of the fragment. That, that, that if one looks at that and tries to sort of conjure up history through it, you don't get to a total understanding. You don't get to that, even though that's what that's the technique you've been deploying. What you end up is making it defamiliar and more strange. But in so doing, you open up a whole series of questions about it. So I think that's the purpose. And I think it does, I think you know, to bring in the notion of achievement, I think it does achieve one closer to sort of some ideas of effect and things like that than in representational work would do, because you are trying to capture and still convey that immediacy of presence through the fragmentary form. Um, it's not just, you know, it's not, the photograph is, the, is I think, the, the, the best and most easy to understand example. I think one finds it in others. You know, walking from the hotel here today, statues out there do that. You know, they are inherently strange, you know, as they recede in time. They obviously, you know, had a real significance. Everyone understood who those people were that were being memorialised. These guys up here, for example. You know, but they, they look ever more strange as time passes because we, we lose the context, if you like. But it's, there's still a context, um, but, but it's one that is deeper in that. And that fragmentary relationship, I think, establishes another way of seeing, another way of attuning to the product. Any questions? Uh, um, thanks. Um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful talk. I think you might have already started to answer, or already answered what I was trying to formulate, asking as you were answering the last one. Um, I, it's just an invitation to um, elaborate more on the theme of tension. Um, and I wonder if you could allow, if you, um, might elaborate on the theme of tension in relation to these themes of like spirituality, which is sort of cropped up earlier in the conference. Um, I love in Zimmel, I absolutely love the theme of tension. One of my favourite kind of favourite uh, you know, mottos of theory that I ever want to go to in Zimmel's um, statement that the that the soul grows when being. I, I haven't got the quote right, but when stretched between two irre irre irreconcilable truths is the space in which the soul grows. And so there's a theme of, of ir irreconcilability being, in par being paradox, irreconcilable truths as this space of kind of soul, soul um, in Zimmel. And then Zimmel's um, 
always, always asking us to think of things as, as where meaning resides, where what significant or creativity resides, as being in the movement and tension, perhaps between um, form and life, between the objective and the subjective. Um, yeah, so I was just yes. you know, struck by uh, where, where you said that the that it that it was like the, the being in tension is how we become attuned to the past, and so if you could. I'll try and say a little bit about that. I'm not sure I'll get to spirituality and whether I'm equipped to answer that bit, I'm not sure. I, it, you know, what I remember of Zimmel's work is, yes, very, very much he, he is looking at, um, not initially, I think, in his earlier sort of middle phase works, the, the tension, later on, that tension becomes betrayal. Um, he's, he's looking at the sort of the, the distinction between the subjective and the objective in culture, with the creative act. You know, to produce art, to produce, produce forms, if you like, is something that he's, in a very humanist way, sees something that's central to human being. That we're all, you know, expressing ourselves and our desires and, and our beliefs through the work that we're doing um, to extend ourselves into the material world. That's, that's certainly what he, he sees. That world then exists in an alienated form, separate from us those who don't know this work, he developed a very sort of thorough and sophisticated theory of alienation long before Marx's um, manuscripts from 1844 had actually been discovered. They were sitting in an archive somewhere that hadn't been read, so he develops independently a theory of alienation. But what then happens with Zimmer is um, that those forms, the material culture, if you like, and photographic images would be one example of that, but there would be many other forms, then exist independently separate from one as a creative being uh, and confront one as, as something alienated and separate. And it becomes more and more melancholy as his life goes on and in, in, in his last writings he's, he's very negative and very um, um, sort of um, worried about this as a sort of you know, a, a, tot a totalizing feature of modern capitalist life that it's a feature of a money economy which abstracts everything and, and that's the sort of I think you know what I'm suggesting here is not the same as that. What I'm suggesting here is um, it's it's sort of I, I I come at this more through um, Foucault's reading of Maurice Blanchet when he talks about sort of the space of the outside in a couple of his essays that. The outside is that which is outside of language, that is outside of discourse, that is the non-discursive, if you like, that is the kind of creative world that we create. We occupy that space, but it is a space that performs us, if you like, at the same time as subjectivity, as subject. So it is not something that is essential to us in any way. It is something that we, that we have. And I think that's captured in some of these notions of photography that, um, that I alluded to there that really it isn't about the act of creating the photograph that really matters, although clearly some people produce much better photographs than others, and there are good photographs and there are bad photographs, there are momentous photographs and there are boring, mundane ones, but they all sort of have this relationship, they all have this sort of tension to the wholeness that they articulate. Now that isn't necessarily always the wholeness of modernity, <coughs> that image might be, you know, a selfie of one's oneself and one's children relates to the wholeness of the family group, say, or to a particular birthday party or whatever. You know, there, there's a relationship there that's still the same, but it's on a different scale. It, it, it performs in a slightly different way. But I think I think it's sort of the, the tension for me there really is around the is around the, the the act of producing the image and the way it then sort of rearticulates us, performs us as subjects in, in that space. It's this notion of the space of the outside that I think appeals to me more than Simmel's distinction between the, the subjective and the objective. Um, whether that's a spiritual space, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. <coughs> Your argument reminds me of uh, an argument that's made quite recently in a book by an anthropologist, Craig Campbell, um, called Agitating Images. And he refers to, you've got Blanchot there in the siren, but your talk right now reminds me, he refers to um, uh, the Thai, and the Thai's essay on the formulas. And he argues that the photograph acts as a, I'm going to get it wrong, but acts as a kind of uh, reference to the formlessness. It, it's an interrupted, it interrupts our archive and our academic and temporal historical archive and his writing and narrative of history, and the photograph becomes this instance of, of reminding the performances of, and the disorder and the disruption and the, uh, 
last year certainly going around. I don't know that for last year certainly. Look, it's, it's in, I think I think last year last year were doing something similar. You know, following the same the year, of course, and, and but last year's work, which I know a little, but not not all, but it's bloody hard. Um, is I think what he's doing, and, and, and there there are it's a, an author that I cite in the text who, who reads him very closely, and I think expresses this quite well. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, um, but it's but it's there. He argues that what, what Blanchot is doing endlessly in all of his writing, whether it be his academic writing, his sort of you know, his non-fiction, as much as in his fiction, is he is continually writing the fragment and also unwriting the fragment. You know, he recognises in that quote at the end, which of course famously Bart quotes in his kind of elusive book, um, encapsulates the kind of position. There's an acknowledgement that the fragment points us in a certain kind of direction. It, it offers up, it presents the promise of a certain form of total understanding from the particular. And yet to achieve that is a betrayal of that very purpose. And what he is doing in, in his work is trying to um, address that issue in different forms and different ways that never actually sort of closes that down but continues to see that as a sort of productive nature. Um, I guess I guess Bataille is doing something similar in this piece of the film. I can't I'm, read some of the Tai's work a long time ago. I'm not sure if I know that particular piece, but it sounds very similar to to Blanche as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for this very inspiring talk. I want to hear more about selfies. Selfies. <laughs> um, because a friend of mine, when there's the weekly Sunday market the flea market to collect old family photos. And they sell it for like almost three. And where I live in Istanbul, people sell old photos of people they don't even know. It's like in the, you know, not in a flea market, but in a second hand shop. Like tons of tons of them. And you don't know those people and you still get them, you collect them, you put it on a cafe wall. You know, it's kind of nice. Yeah. And in my work, I also encounter people who are in love with taking selfies, skipping the encounter of an act, of an art act, and trying to, you know, just inhale and then leave, and then, I don't know, consume it maybe elsewhere. So that was very interesting to listen to you as I yeah. struggled with these thoughts, and I was thinking, what happens when you you know, now, yes. try to skip the encounter again and try to go to the interpretation somehow, and then what happens when you sell what's outside? I guess what's going on there, um, and I recognize some of that, because it, you, know, you can buy old photographs here, you know, they're often pretty cheap, but unless they are like, famous people and so on. No, they're not I, famous people. Right. Yeah, I guess what's going on there is what, what people are interested in, this, but, I, but I guess this sort of an element. It's, it's not the people themselves, it's the time, it's the pastness that they're interested in. There may be some who are interested in costume or you know, particular interiors and have a more specialist interest in, in sort of things in the past. But it's the, it, it is the evocative nature of the past that I guess that they're sort of interested in. It's too, known, it's too soon to know whether selfies will do the same kind of thing. I suspect they will. If not that long ago, for example, that um, you know, 20 years ago maybe the, the, the common thing that people had, I guess they still do to some extent, although um, digital photography has, has somewhat changed this. Lots of people had little pin boards up in their kitchens with photographs of their families and friends on it. It was, it was a very common thing that was sort of happening, particularly in sort of 80s and 90s. Um, but now they're probably all stored in the cloud or they're, they're on their computer or maybe they're Maybe some people have still got, got some of those pinballs. But that now looks like of a time. And I guess what I'm saying here is that, you know, what, what, what that conveys, if you are approaching that as a fragment, is it, con it conveys the possibility of an understanding of the past. But if you <coughs> seek to overload it with meaning, you will ruin it. Mm. You, will, you will simply get the meaning you attributed to it. You will lose its affect. Um, whereas if you if you withdraw from that attempt 
to define, understand, this is the 1920s or something like that, then you, you may then sort of convey and capture something of that the spirit of that time in a different way. You may become more attuned to it than if you are simply trying to interpret and, and, and derive a you know, representational significance from that image. Okay, I think um, probably if we make this the last question, if that's all right. Um, that the fragment ex exceeds meaning, it has much more, and if you're restricted to meaning, to one meaning, or try to include one meaning into it, then you are taking away a lot of what, what makes it. What worries me a little bit is that this attributing it of meaning and saying it doesn't have a meaning on itself, basically turns everything into the void of meaning. You can't, you can't have a word with a meaning because the word exceeds meaning. It's a fragment also. So at the end, you don't have anything representational because everything is, is a potential fragment. It's, it, yes, it, it, that, 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 well, that, that's the tension, if you like, that to look at, particularly to look at the, the photograph as a fragment more than, say, other forms. It's really tempting to try and interpret it, to try and, you know, say, ah, 1848, what that meant for, you know, the socialist movement, development of capitalism, all of that. But that, for me, is a betrayal. Um, what I'm trying to get at, if you like, is that shock effect, is that affect that one encounters with the image that requires one to draw back from attributing some kind of met metaphor to what you see. So it's not a void as such, it's, it's an opening onto other ways of knowing. Um, and I think it's that, that's where the radical power of the fragment lies. It invites that, it invites other ways of knowing, other ways of understanding, not only our own lives, but the lives of those who we seek to attune to with the in the past. It's a different approach than to sort of try and understand, try to derive meaning, try to represent, try to try to do all that kind of work. It's not that that doesn't get done, it does, and that's what a lot of the work on the ruin, I think, is all about. And I think, as I say, that you know, the problem with, 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 with quite a bit of that work is that it's trying to do the same thing, but it's then going that step and saying, you know, we can interpret these industrial ruins, we can make sense of them, you know, Tim Edison's work and things like that. You know, they're using the same kind of sources, they're using the same kind of approaches, but then, you know, the image is supplemented by the text, the text is used to explain the image, the fragment is lost in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the process, that would be what I would say. So I would say we need to be braver, we need to not be tempted to, to lay meaning on things with a trap.